Everybody hear me okay back there? Good to go? Okay. Uh, Jan, thank you very much. Uh, what I'd like to do first is just begin by, by thanking you all for having me here this evening. Uh, Jan's absolutely right. Um, I, I hate to admit that I, I'm new to this, but I'm new to you. Um, this has been a topic that's been very near and dear to my heart and those of some of my colleagues for quite some time. Um, but truth be told, there's some folks here that probably need more recognition, certainly more than me, but probably more than just about anybody else in this endeavor. Uh, and, and special thanks to, to Jan and Chase. Thank you very much. Um, as Jan had said, you know, I had the protection of an entire apparatus, a national security organization at my disposal. And uh, I was able to operate in a way where I had a significant budget for, for most of the time. I had a staff, I had resources, I had, I had things that I could use that were at my disposal to get a better understanding of this. And I could also operate in a good degree of anonymity, which means I didn't have to worry about a lot of the things that you all did. And so here's Jan and Chase and everybody else in this room doing their, their job day in and day out and committed to something where sometimes people may have associated you as being fringe or being out there and all along, you were right. So uh, I, I'd like to commend you on that, but one other person in this, in this audience too, um, people are commending me for coming out. And uh, they're saying, oh, the first time the U.S. government's coming out, they've actually acknowledged the program, and, and here you are speaking for the first time about the phenomena. But let's not forget, I was not the first person to come out uh, and, and, and talk on behalf of a very controversial subject on behalf of their country. There was one other person in this audience that did it before me. And uh, I, I suspect that individual went through some of the same trials and tribulations, if not maybe even more so. And that's Mr. Nick Pope over here. So the reason why I say that, um, the ward is truly, truly lovely, but, but I have to admit there's probably other people in this audience, uh, the majority of people in this audience have probably deserved a little bit more than me. Um, but I, I, I humbly appreciate the, the gesture. It is certainly, certainly appreciated, um, and I will cherish it. But Mr. Nick Pope decided to come out at a time when this topic not only was a controversial, but we were, we were really struggling with a lot of things worldwide. And so um, I will be spending a little bit of time with him later on because I certainly would like to... to to share some of uh, his thoughts and ideas and perspectives and observations. I think between uh, maybe what his organization did and what our organization did, we may be able to better, um, if you will, as a collective whole, uh, push this finally to the finish line. And by the way, hopefully after tonight's presentation, we'll get around to some questions here. Uh, I, I promise I will try not to yammer on too long, um, but hopefully, um, you will have the same understanding that I do, and that is, I think the same time next year, we're gonna have a fundamentally different conversation. I think, um, I think disclosure already occurred. I don't think necessarily disclosure is an event, I think it's a process, and I think that process began. Um, and that is entirely in large part by the help of you. Uh, you folks had a heck of a lot more to risk than I did. Um, because you had neighbors to talk to that would look at you and kind of say, what are you doing? You had spouses, you had children, you had family. Um, and, you know, you, I, I think you all risked a, a hell of a lot yourself. So with that said, I'd like to go ahead and start with a presentation. Uh, all right, so here we go. I've been told I can kind of control it myself with a clicker. Up on top, of course. Trained observer. So uh, I think when this first came out, everybody was kind of asking some questions about what this program is. What I'd like to do tonight is just briefly go over a little bit about the program, a little bit of the history, what it is, what it isn't, and then maybe where do we go next? What do we do? 
So as you see here, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Um, it is indeed aerospace. I know some folks that said aviation, some folks at the Pentagon said aviation. Um, I can assure you here tonight, it is indeed Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, ATIP. And some of the documentation that has come out, not from me, um, that was authored by members of Congress, you will see quite clearly back in 2009, it is indeed called ATIP Advanced Aerospace. Now, why is that important? Um, I don't know, maybe it's not important. But I think it's, I, what I do think is important that when we're here talking about facts, um, that's a fact. And so I think it's important that we also talk the same, same language. So in this particular case, the program actually began from another program. We're gonna get into that tonight. This is the contract focus for ATIP. Um, pretty heavy stuff. Uh, no, we weren't looking at balloons. No, we weren't looking at drones. We weren't looking at aircraft. Um, this is real. This is what your $22 million worth of tax money was spent on. And there's a lot of it. Um, so I'll give you a minute to take a look at it. Some of the highlights there, human effects. What does that mean? Signature reduction. I mean, a lot of this stuff you would look and say, yeah, this is definitely DOD centric. This is something that the Department of Defense National Security Apparatus would definitely be interested in. Some of this other stuff, you gotta kinda scratch your head and say, well, is that a DOD mission? I would submit to you, yes, absolutely it is. Especially when you're trying to protect airmen and when you're trying to protect sailors and soldiers. Uh, my focus, before I go to the next slide, um, was to focus on Title 10, which means DOD specific. There's a big difference uh, between looking at DOD folks and looking at the rest of the world. So when they ask you, did you talk to civilians? Did you talk to these people? No, we didn't. We focused on military. And by the way, that was a lot. It's not like this happens ones and twosies. There was a significant amount of volume just focusing on that. I'd like to go back to that slide for just a second. Um, let's look at the very bottom where we say investigate legitimacy of currently observed phenomena. This is brief to the senior levels of the Department of Defense. We choose our words very carefully. They are deliberate. We write words on purpose because they mean something. So when you're saying investigate the legitimacy of currently, not in the past, currently observed phenomena, that's what we were doing. And again, we'll open this up for questions, and so if anybody has any, I'm sure there'll be some questions on the slides. And of course, at the bottom, uh, are they achievable by current understanding of physics and engineering? And if not, what research, studies, is required in order to achieve that? Okay, so what does all those studies really distill down to? And a lot of you have heard about the five observables. Well, what you really are looking at, I'm not sure if this has a laser pointer. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I'm not gonna try. So if you look at the top left, you're talking about instantaneous acceleration. You've heard that a lot. But why from a DOD perspective would that be something important? Well, as you see here, thrust vectoring, G-force protection, right, for our pilots. Uh, maneuverability, enhanced maneuverability, the ability to, to, to take an aircraft from point A to point B and then pat back to point A again uh, very quickly without having any ill effects on, on the human inside. The next one is hypersonic velocity. Again, from a DOD perspective, you can imagine why that would be important. So that means I can get my people and equipment very quickly anywhere in the world enemy evasion, they can't go as fast as me, and then first strike capability in a strategic type environment. Better to know that if you're gonna to go to war with an enemy, that you can strike first. Um, okay, so the other one is low observability. It's kind of falling off the slide there, but it, you'll have to trust me, it says low observability. A bit of an oxymoron when we say it's an observable, but it was. Um, but from a DOD perspective, 
why would that be important? I'm going to go back to my slide. Oh, there we go. Uh, reduce cross section. Okay, so if you if you lower your your observability, you're lowering your cross section. Survivability. If they can't see you, they can't hit you. And then anonymity. Maybe you don't necessarily want to advertise that you're coming in somewhere or that you're going to do something, right? These new stealth aircraft and the new stealth helicopter that everybody talked about on the Bin Laden raid, you know. Whoa, whose is that? Um, Multimedia travel. Why would that be important? Again, here you see here there's some strategic surprise, meaning you now have an object that can operate in air, water, space. Hmm, probably gives you some target flexibility. And last, last but not least, battle space dominance, meaning you can operate in virtually all environments, anytime, anywhere. And then the last one is positive lift. And of course, why would that be important? As we see here, we're looking at flight precision. I do not have to be moving like an aircraft to generate lift under my wings. That would be tremendous benefit. Loiter capability. I can stay on time on target for longer, and then last but not least, decreased signature. So you can see these, these focus areas are really DOD-centric. Um, they are part of the core DOD mission, both from a defensive and offensive perspective. Um, so uh, this is how those five observables that we, we saw the commonalities, if you will, how they fit within the DOD mission. Because some people will ask you, you know, why, why, why was DOD looking at this? Should NASA be looking at it? Should somebody? Well, sure, NASA could look at it, but so should we. Next slide, please. I guess that's me. I'm hearing, I'm hearing whispers behind the curtain. That's you. Okay. So uh, the next few slides um, are a little bit of ATIP history here. I'm not going to read word for word, but what I'm going to do is just kind of paraphrase. Um, there were three senators, Senator Reid, Senator Inouye, Senator Stevens, bipartisan, Republican and Democrat. Okay. They all agreed that uh, there was sufficient information to warrant increased study into the phenomenon. They, along with Senator John Glenn, former astronaut, got together and they began to scratch their heads and figure out what is the best way to do it. Well, in Congress, you give money to an organization that's capable of doing something with it. In this case, the money was provided to an organization called the Defense Intelligence Agency. It's kind of like the CIA equivalent for DOD. It went to this small little office, and the initial contract vehicle was called AWSAP, uh, Advanced Aerospace Weapons uh, Special Application Program, System Application Program. A lot of folks will say, well, Lou, when you first came out, why didn't you just tell us that? Well, the reason is because I wasn't really part of that. And that's really not my place to discuss a mission and an organization that I was really walking into the tail end. I was brought in to, to conduct counterintelligence and security for an organization that was in the process of evolving into something else. There was another director running that program. So it would be disingenuous for me to simply say, well, ATIP is really OSAP. Well, it evolved from OSAP, but it is not OSAP. And I think the documentation that's beginning to come out into the public forum, people are beginning to realize that. It wasn't a purpose attempt to try to subdue or to, to hide or conceal the relationship. I just wasn't really qualified to talk about it. And what I don't want to do is, hopefully you're beginning to learn here, is provide information that I'm not qualified to discuss with you. There's two ground rules, as far as I'm concerned, involving this program. I'll answer any question you have, but there's only there's something I, will, I can't discuss, which is classified information. Don't ask me. I'm not going to tell you. And if it requires a classified answer, I am not going to violate my oath nor my, 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 my non-disclosure agreement with the U.S. government. But short of that, I'll answer it. And if I don't have an answer, I'm going to tell you I don't have an answer and I don't know. I'll be completely as forthcoming as I can, because there are things I don't know. In fact, there's a lot more I don't know than I do know, but that's okay. That's why we have to continue to seek to find the answers and collect the data, because ultimately, the data will speak for itself. The truth, she, you know, she's funny. She always speaks. Sometimes she whispers, so you have to listen real carefully. 
but but if you listen hard enough, you you, you can you can hear her speak. So that's a little bit of the the history on this slide here. Um, the in 2008, the program was really only OSAP for a very very short period of time. Oh, please pardon. Thank you. I might hurt myself with this. Um, okay. Thank you. So. Uh, as you see here uh, towards the end, in 2008, the program was already beginning to evolve. The, the, the original OSAP um, portfolio was much broader than the ATIP. The decision was made early on that we would go ahead and focus the effort more to the phenomena specific, looking at the observables and the identifiables. What can we look at? What can we collect on? What can we report on back to senior DOD leadership? Because that's what they're concerned with and try to remove as much speculation, supposition, and, uh, and innuendos as possible out of the calculus. So more history. So as you see here, the 2008 to 2009, um, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of collection going on, a lot, to the point where, where we're, we're almost becoming overloaded with the results and the data. Uh, it, it's, it's becoming quite clear to us that there is much more to this portfolio than we in, envisioned. And I, I suspect um, when you look at this 2009 congressional letter sent to DOD leadership, Congress was aware of that too, to the point where we were worried there may be a potential counterintelligence threat. Maybe there were foreign adversaries that were interested in what we were collecting. That's how much we were collecting. Um, you see down here, uh, 2009 specific elements in DOD resist the effort. Um, this is a detail I really haven't talked about much. Uh, you know, everybody handles this information differently. And in the department is no different than in, out here in the public forum. People have their ideas, they have their preconceived notions, they have their bias, and they have their belief systems. And by no means do I have the right or the qualifications to tell anybody what they should or should not believe in. But there are some people who have a great deal of conviction, just as you have conviction right now in the UAP UFO phenomena, they have equal conviction from a theological perspective in their own. And by the way, that contradicts with what we were trying to do, for better or for worse. And I'm not saying that's good, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it's a fact that there were elements within the department that rigorously opposed what we were trying to do, not because the results were not real, but because it contradicted their view. Um, that's all I've got to say about that. 2013 through 2014. Um, you see where they say, uh, some folks have said in the past, and by the way, the Department of Defense is a fantastic organization. True patriots. These are folks that give their, 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 their they sacrifice their families, livelihood and their life to to defend us so so this is not necessarily a hit on the department um, but sometimes the department is a big organization sometimes they don't necessarily have all the data in front of them all the time and so when they said the program ended in 2012 well the funding was actually to 2013 and after 2013 there was some other funding vehicles that were done to get it through 2013 and 2014 now, I won't go into detail what happened with those fundings. The funding actually came through. It actually wound up getting rerouted to another organization because the language was vague. And so, therefore, we were forced to continue the program um, on minimal funds. Now, people say, well, the funding dries up, so does the organization and the program. That's not true. How many of you have ever served in the military or are serving in the military? Show of hands real quick. Have ever served. Fantastic. Um, so you know, as a good soldier, when you are given a mission, you are given an order to guard your post, you guard your post until you are relieved of that responsibility. Well, that order never came for us. And in the Department of Defense, there's always a paper trail. When you establish an organization, there's a paper trail. When you disestablish an organization, there's a paper trail. You won't find one for this program. So I think that's, I think that's very important that people understand that the program never really went away. Sure, funding for the 2013 went away, but the program never went away. We were never told, you no longer have to guard your post. So uh, 2017, uh, some guy makes, oops, 
some guy makes a, a dumb decision to, uh, to I guess, leave the Department of Defense, um, uh, you know, and uh, has some conversations. And in October 4th, 2017, the rest is history. So let's go into a little bit about what ATIP is. ATIP evolved from OSAP. That is absolutely true. OSAP existed for a short period of time under another director to focus on the UAP specific capabilities and concentrated on the what and how interrogatives. Not the who, not the when, but what is it and how does it work? That's it. And if we could accomplish that, hopefully smarter people in the department could figure out who's behind the wheel, what are their intentions, where are they from, etc. ATIP was comprised of US government contractor and military personnel. It's a fact. Everybody hears about Bigelow Aerospace. That is a true statement. Uh, we worked with academics. We worked with the services. We worked with certain elements in the intelligence community. We worked with anybody and everybody with a military nexus that we could talk to that could provide some information. Cast a wide net. Uh, ATIP commissioned large volumes of related research data, academic studies, and collected data even from the field. True statement. Uh, volumes and volumes of information. I cannot go into detail specifically on what some of that is because it remains some of it classified. Uh, I believe two days ago a laundry list of some of our studies had come out, uh, albeit one of them was classified. Um, I can tell you that that is a correct list. Um, that, is a, that is a true list of academic studies. If you get a chance to review them, I think you'll agree that, um, once again, we're not really talking about balloons. Uh, much of ATIP information remains FOIA exempt. FOIA exempt? What do you mean? Everything's FOIAble. No, it's not. Exceptions one and five. Why would you mark information FOIA exempt? Well, for one, so the adversary never gets a chance to see it. People say, well, if ATIP existed, I should be able to FOIA it. Not necessarily. And some of the documents that were recently released as a result, if you take a look at, um, at a recent letter that uh, I supposedly came from Senator Reid, on the very last page at the very bottom, you're going to see a really interesting little word words, actually, uh, it says FOIA exempt. That's right. We use that sometimes. Now, we don't use it to keep a secret from the American people. In fact, that's illegal. What we do is we use it to keep it out of the hands of foreign adversaries. And it is an effective tool. So keep in mind, a lot of the counter argument as well, you're keeping this secret from the American people. That is not the case. If we had a mechanism where we could inform every American citizen and ensure it didn't get out into enemy hands, we would do it. The government doesn't try to keep secrets from you. It tries to keep secrets from the enemy. And there's no way to tell 500 million people in one geographic region and not let that get out somewhere else. So, so that is why a lot of this information you see is FOIA exempt. Now, is it the right thing to do? Is it the wrong thing to do? I don't know. And, and I, I don't know. Is it an effective mechanism? Absolutely it is. Okay, so what a tip isn't? Um, this is just a small sample of, of, of things that we have heard over time um, that people have speculated upon. So let me see if I can just address it head on. A tip ended in 2012. Well, I think it's pretty clear that didn't happen. Um, ATIP found nothing of significance. Not true. Uh, in fact, I think the mere fact that we even have the five observables and, and we can have an honest conversation about the physics shows that we did achieve something. And when I say we folks, I'm not saying me, not Luis Elizondo. I'm talking about the fantastic human beings that I left behind at the Department of Defense. Those are the true heroes. Those are the folks that still remain back there, anonymous, working day in, day out, making this happen. So um, 
ATIP did find a lot of things of significance. ATIP was a political favor. Um, let's get this straight. By the way, for the record, I'm apolitical. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, don't know, don't care. Uh, my job is to serve whoever is in charge at the time. My job is also to serve you, the American people, the taxpayer. You employ me. So therefore, my loyalty is to you. As a result, um, people will say, well, this was something that Senator Reid did as a favor to his one of his constituents, Bob Bigelow. I saw this process work. By the way, Bigelow Aerospace was chosen by none other than DIA. And by the way, a formal contract selection committee. The senator had nothing to do with it. In fact, he could not get involved with it. So um, I think that's important distinction because people, in the absence of information, in that void, we as human beings have a tendency to fill that void with either what we know, what we think, and even sometimes what we don't know. Um, so I want to make sure it's very clear that it was not a political affair. It was a bipartisan effort by both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, all of them served their country honorably. All of them had served in the military. Senator Inouye literally gave his right arm for his country. Senator Stevens, what is now coming to light, actually witnessed one of these things when he was a pilot. So um, I think I think if we're going to have a conversation about political favors, we at least need to speak truth to power when we have that conversation. A tip was only academic. Yeah, we produce a lot of academic studies, and we commissioned a hell of a lot of reports. Um, but that's not all. Um, a tip was involved with actually speaking with individuals, collecting electro optical data, collecting radar data, uh, talking to the eyewitnesses, and these eyewitnesses are people. Keep in mind to have security clearances. They are trained observers. In some cases, we have spent millions of dollars into their training, whether they're special operations, whether they're pilots, whether they're intelligence officers. They have been paid to be critical thinkers, and they have been trained to look at a silhouette and determine if that's a MiG-25, a MiG-29, it's in the 90-degree roll, and it's at 200 kilometers in front of me, traveling at 200 knots. Um, these are some of the data points that we used when collecting the data and, and analyzing this information. ATIP leaked the videos. Okay, first of all, let's go into a, a quick legal definition of quote unquote leaking. Leaking means you take classified information and you provide it in an unauthorized manner. It, it goes out to the public. That's a leak. Um, that is not the case, first of all, these videos went through a proper classification review process. The documentation at some point will probably come out. I'm not going to provide it. That's not my job. You want it? Get it from the government. They released it. They released, they authorized, let me, let me get this right, they authorized the release of those videos. And they did it in writing. Now, why they did it, you have to bring it up to them. I know the purposes that we wanted for them to come out. And that was to establish an unclassified community of interests that everybody could be part of and look at and say, hey, I saw something like that too. But um, no one leaked these videos. If that was the case, I would be in an orange jumpsuit right now. And I do not look good in orange. So believe me. Um, OK. A tip is a ploy for the administration's new Space Force. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin with that. Um, no. Uh, now, could it be used to bolster that argument? Sure. Okay. In the end, if it helps us, go ahead, use it. I don't care. I think that's great. You want to say that, that the UAP studies is now helping us create a space force so we can go ahead and look at this problem seriously? Sign me up. Sure. Um, again, here we go into the to the to, to the habit of filling in information voids with things that we don't know. I don't know why the administration is creating a Space Force. Maybe it's a good idea. Maybe it's not such a good idea. I don't know. Uh, I think ultimately it's up to voters to decide. You make the decision if it is or not. But I will tell you, if our humble little program, ATIP, 
helped inform that decision, and they are going to come back and fund this program in a robust manner where we're going to look at it logically. We're going to look at it with the best scientists and intelligence officers and critically really look at this. I mean, alternative analysis, uh, healthy skepticism, but, but of course, alternative analysis. If it's going to help that, let's do it. Sure. So, so what's happening now? Why are we here? Not why we're all here. Uh, the conversation has finally moved, folks, from the fringe. So congratulations, you succeeded. Um, if you were to ask me eight months ago that I'd be standing up here and having this conversation and briefing you this, no way. I'd say we're five years away from even getting close to this. So my, how things have moved so quickly. Now, I understand people are impatient. I'm impatient. My daughter will tell you. She's right here in the audience. I'm, I'm impatient. I don't like to wait. I want my information now. But as I've told people before, there is a difference be getting, between giving you information right versus giving you information right now. They're not always necessarily the same. I'd rather give you information right versus right now. Um, so it is important that we do our due diligence. It's important that when we are looking at the data that we analyze it, we quantify it, we qualify it, do all the things necessary. So by the time we present it, it's like a court of law, right? You don't want a chief prosecutor talking to the jury with a half-baked case. That's a dereliction of duty. It is incumbent. It's their professional responsibility to make sure they get it right. And here is the data as best as we know it to be as of now. Uh, can we go back with those slides real quick? Uh, okay. So. Don't look now, people are now having a conversation over the dinner table. Mainstream media has talked about this several times. Uh, they're getting it. It takes, it takes a little while, but they're having a conversation. And now all these people say, hey, we thought you guys were crazy. Oh, maybe you're right. Um, so we've come a long way. ATIP focus areas remain relevant still to both national security and to humanity. That's why we're here, right? What you'd say here, I think, to future of humanity. Um, I'd like to talk about that for a minute. National security, well, if you have something that can fly in and out of your airspace undetected, you can't stop it, you don't know how it works. Is that a threat? I don't know. Is it a threat? The fact that we can't answer that, we have to presume there's a possibility it could be a threat. And I would submit to you, you want us to think that way. That is national security. You don't want us assuming that something is not a threat without all the data points. That is not what we pay the Department of Defense to do. Um, humanity. Relevant to humanity. Um, I, I've said this before. I don't know the impact this has to humanity and what we should do about it. That's a decision you all need to make. My job's simple. Collect the truth, tell the truth. That's it. Not hard. I mean, at least I didn't think it was hard. It's hard. Uh, but Really, the, the, the big, the big the heavy lifting here is you all, because you're the ones that have to tell national leadership what you want. You're the ones that vote. You're the ones that, that sit there and call congressmen and senators and say, I want action, right? So uh, I, think, I think the effects on humanity, is, is, it does have effect, but, but ultimately that story is still being written, and how that story ends is really dependent on you. TTSA and others are creating the environment for elements within the executive and legislative branch to have the discussion. People have asked, what are you doing? Well, we're doing what we can. Does TTSA have contacts and connections? Probably. Uh, but I also understand the need for privacy. I also understand and respect the need to give people an a, a, a operational safe space to collect information and make an informed decision without necessarily unnecessary political pressure. Uh, we have to give people trade space. Time will be necessary to allow leadership proper awareness and assessment. You cannot digest a seven course meal in 10 minutes, folks. It takes time. You've had, some of you had decades involved in this. So what you know to be a fact 
people are just now hearing it for the very first time. As crazy as that may seem, it's true. For some folks, the, the article that came out in the New York Times is the very first time they've ever actually even considered this topic, let alone our leadership, let alone our lawmakers. So I think, I think you are well on the way of getting what you're seeking. I think we have tremendous momentum like never before. I think the efforts with organizations such as MUFON, now is not the time to throttle back. Now is the time to push the throttle all the way forward. That's what I think. Um, if you are looking for government to give you new acknowledgement and just give you full disclosure, um, I'll tell you right here and now, the government's job is not to satisfy idle curiosity. That's not the function of the government. I know we want it to be, but that's not the case. The purpose of the government is to defend this country from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, if there's information out there that could be helpful in doing so, they're going to be involved. And if there's information out there that doesn't really relate to that, to that mission but could be helpful to us, well, that's where we get involved. That's, that's, that's how, how, how we can help. Let's go back to this. There we go. Um, organizations like TTSA are developing initiatives like the Community of Interest, data repositories, and information sharing. Information sharing, don't think of it as just being here. Information sharing is international. It is global. As we have seen before, there's many nations here represented. That is exactly what we need to continue to do, both as a society and as a government. So uh, in my opinion anyways, um, I think getting over the finish line, if there's really such a thing as a finish line, there might not be. This might be an enduring effort, and if you're looking for the satisfaction that I can say, I made it, that day may never come. Maybe it does, but that may never come. Maybe the sat satisfaction of knowing that people can finally have the conversation at the dinner table, that you can turn on CNN or Fox News or BBC or what else, and people are having conversations with reputable experts and they're funding programs to look into it. Maybe that's success. I mean, we all have our different definition of what success is, right? Okay, so last but not least, um, my, my purpose here was simply to give you a broad overview, kind of dispel some of the myths. We could sit here all night and talk about ATIP. I, I, I get it, and I'm, I'm happy to do so if I don't think uh, Jan would or you all would appreciate that. But um, there's a lot more to this. And I, uh, before I open this up to questions, I want to say one last thing. I am confident and I am cautiously optimistic that um, in the next year, we are going to have a fundamentally different conversation than we're having today. I think there's going to be additional fidelity uh, to, to a lot of the things that have come out recently that are going to, oh, is wrong? That are going to be able to, oh, have a sound trouble, that are, 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 are going to help us um, have a better understanding of what it is we're actually seeing here. So. With that said, Jan, are you okay if we open the, the floor to, dis to questions? Whoops. My microphone on? Okay. I'd say I'll do it right now, sure. So, so I, I, I asked Lou if he could just talk about the role he sees MUFON playing in this, sure. uh, based on what he's doing and the things that are going on within our government. Uh, real quick, I know we've got some questions out there, so we'll get to you. Um, what role does MUFON have in this? MUFON can do something nobody else can do. DOD cannot engage the private sector. It doesn't have the capacity, it doesn't have the, the, the resources, and it damn sure doesn't have the mission. That's not DOD's mission. DHS, they don't either. FAA, well, maybe to some degree, but not a whole lot. Um, the only ones that can really do that is a private organization. And MUFON has the track record. It has the expertise. You guys have been around since 1969. 
I, I, I just ask people to look at the mission statement of, of, of MUFON. Look at those three tiers. That's not a DOD mission. That will never be a DOD mission. That will never be a government mission. That's a MUFON mission. And that's what makes MUFON so special. That's why TTSA, we're not replicating you guys. We don't want to do what you guys do because we'll never be as good as you guys doing it. We have our own niche, but we need to work collaboratively and collectively together to the common goal. This is, this is, a, this is a team effort, right? On, 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 uh, I hate to use a battle space, but let, let's, let's talk about baseball then, right? You have a pitcher. No one can do the job like a pitcher like a pitcher, but no one can be a first baseman like a first baseman, and no one can be a catcher like a catcher, right? In, in, in the battle space arena, no one can be a pilot but a pilot. No one can be a soldier but a soldier. You know, everybody has their own roles and responsibilities. And I think we need to work collectively together um, and continue to push, push the needle forward. TTSA will, 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 never, will never be in this trade space. But it's, it's, this is your trade space. This is what you're good at. We'll never be that. But we can do other things. We can be a bridge, right? We can help engage people because of certain people's experiences and access that maybe MUFON doesn't have resident in-house. So while you're trying to do one thing, we can come over on this side of the field and do something else and meet in the end zone. So. Thank you. Okay, so I've got two things to tell you. The first is that they're tearing down the desserts and the coffee. So if you'd like to get some, now's the time. The second thing is that we're gonna have Q&A queued up here. So if you want to ask a question, line up here uh, this way. And that and gentleman with the black shirt has been having his hand up. I'd, I'd <laughs> like to give an opportunity to go first. Okay. Do you want him to go first? That's this, nice. This That's gentleman nice. right there. Okay. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Sky, and she's going to hand the oh, mic to you. Hold for you. So here go the questions. If you have tomatoes, please, I'm wearing a dark suit. Don't throw them at me. When John Podesta left the Obama White House, he held a press conference. And at that conference, he said his saddest moment in public service was his inability to get to the bottom of the UFO phenomenon. My question to you is, did Podesta ever reach out to you, attempt to make contact, and if he made contact because of his security clearance, were you able to tell him things that you are not able to tell us. Sir, out of respect for, for Mr. John Podesta, you would have to reserve that question for him. I do not have the, the, uh, the, the right to speak. It's, that's a two-part question. And I would not feel right about even addressing that without him being in the room uh, and, and addressing that question. Did you ever talk to him? Did you ever talk to him? Again, that's a question you'd have to ask Mr. John Podesta, sir. Hi, Larry. Hi. Uh, uh, I want to first of all say I think you mentioned to us that, uh, and please tell me if I'm incorrect about this, but that uh, your program was actually using MUFON files, right? You were looking at our files and, and using that as uh, part of your uh, data uh, to look at in terms of uh, the behavior of these craft, uh, the physiological effects they had on people as they approached them, was that, is that accurate? Um, so as a Title X organization, we're supposed to focus on uh, DOD-centric um, things. Um, but uh, it is a true statement that information from um, expertise from all sorts of places often made it across our desks. Um, because with limited, keep in mind with limited resources, you don't want to spend it reinventing the wheel, right? So if you have credible data, you have credible data sets that you can use uh, that corroborates other data points, then you'd want to use it, right? Um, so I, I, I can't specifically uh, say something that would inadvertently endorse one organization and its relevance to national security, but what I can tell you is that, that um, we would want to look at things holistically, and the more data points that came in, the better. And what I can say that MUFON has a wonderful reputation of, of doing good, solid investigative work. That I can say. 
Um, I just have uh, one little comment and a follow-up question, and uh, you, you may want to think about it for a second, but uh, everything that you've told us tonight uh, are things that we figured out 50 years ago. And we've, been, and we've known all these things, especially in terms of the five observables related to uh, how these craft behave and so forth. And so clearly right now today as we stand here in this room, all these people have dedicated their lives to the study of this for, for a reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons that we've done it is so that we could have some kind of validation for uh, regarding the things that we know. And now we have this through the ATIP program. It is acknowledged that these objects exist. And you mentioned that you uh, never touched on the questions of who's behind the wheel and uh, you know that that kind of thing and, and what are their intentions and so uh, you know we can spend another 50 years saying well that object was red and it did this but why we know that these objects are real and so my question to you is what is truly the next step are we not talking about exopolitics well what we haven't discussed yet is the fact that it's not just we know what the observables are we now know the physics for the first time, we have the mathematical formulas with the scientific modeling, with the observations of eyewitnesses, with the electro-optical data, with the electromechanical data such as radar returns, all saying the same thing. And it's not just speculation now. We actually have models, the physics. We understand at the quantum level how that works. And that is something that if people in this room figured out 50 years ago, congratulations, because we're a lot slower than you. Um, but that, for me, is what's so exciting. So again, my, half my mission of how it works, that was, I think, the accomplishment, the contribution of ATIP, is that we did get the best minds to figure out the mathematics and modeling to say, this isn't a 1,000 years in the future. This may not even be 100 years in the future. This might just be 25 years in the future. I mean, we, a lot of us in this room may be around to actually begin to enjoy and exploit some of this technology. I mean, that's profound. So, um, I guess uh, if I could one more time, I apologize. Uh, uh, again, uh, the question would be, uh, you know, you, you said you purposefully didn't look at Correct. who's behind the wheel, and so, and, but you do have a personal opinion about that, right? Uh, of course I have a personal opinion, but you know what they say about opinions. Right? <laughs> I, I guess the, the question is, and I guess I would just leave it open, who's behind the wheel and what are their intentions? Great questions, and that's for MUFON to help answer. <laughs> Hi, sir, how are you? Great, uh, great. Uh, I don't get it. Considering that there are more than sufficient checks and balances in the government that uh, among them, uh, Executive Order 13526, uh, Section 1.7, and 13526, 3.1, which not only say um, you can't classify things to conceal wrongdoing, and you got to classify something if it's in the, uh, declassify something if it's in the public interest, which overpowers national security at all times, why don't you use that to justify exercising your right to go against your oath to declassify that stuff and use that those checks and balances in court to defend yourself if they decide to come after you like they do the other sure. whistleblowers. So great question because I have unfortunately Executive Order One Two Nine Five Eight and Executive Order One Two Triple Three that I have to abide by, plus DoD Directive Fifty Two Forty Dot One Fifty Two Forty Dot One R, and a whole host of other Fifty Two Hundred series. Sorry. Um, yes, sir. I want you to comment or to answer. Uh, it's about an event that took place in northern uh, Montreal, in Quebec, and uh, someone, a witness, not only just saw a triangular UFO, mm -hmm. but he took a picture of it. Mm -hmm. And then the next morning, he called the army. And uh, the army was asking him, uh, what have you uh, took with your, uh, mm -hmm. have you took a picture of it? He said, yes, with what? And he said, with the iPhone 4. And uh, they asked him a lot of questions. And after that, he couldn't access his phone. And, and after he could access his phone, the photo was still there, but blurry, all blurry. And this, this photo was nice enough to get in the local newspaper, and even on their larger scale newspaper. But I want 
your comment, please. Uh, I, I don't have one for Canada. Um, you know, I, I would take that up with the with the Canadian government. Uh, NORAD was involved also. So NORAD is Canadian and U.S. I'm sorry, military. NORAD. NORAD. Well, I, I can't speculate if, if NORAD was involved or not. I, I, I don't have any evidence of that. Um, uh, you know, I think it would be unusual for for um, NORAD to be involved in something like that. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but that's not really within the mission scope of it. Um, what I would encourage anybody to do when we hear information that's hearsay, um, it's really important we actually have and I'm not saying this is not the case, it could be the case, but in general, we can't just take things at face value. Um, that's what makes this job so difficult because there's a lot of good people with good intentions that see a lot of things. Um, and even with their own pilots, I, I, I've got to have the data to back it up. And so if somebody is coming into a, a phone and surreptitiously doing something to modify uh, a, a, a picture, um, in the United States, that requires legal authorities that are well beyond anything that NORAD would be able to th throw out of their hip pocket and just do. I mean, you're, you're, you're going into a private citizen's phone. Um, so uh, I, I would be interested to see some of the data, maybe some of the algorithms or the, the heuristics to see was NORAD really involved. Because I'd be very surprised if they really were. Again, I'm not defending NORAD. I don't really know if they did or didn't. But that would be really unusual, unless there was some sort of foreign intelligence connection and it wasn't really a picture of a triangle, uh, it was a picture of something else, very, very significant. But again, that's pure speculation on my part. I'm, I, I don't know, to be honest with you. But I do know that things happen in Canada that are pretty interesting. So, in one word, you said it's illegal? Uh, it, is, it is unusual. Sorry, I know I'm not being helpful, sorry. Hi, could you elaborate your uh, role at TTSA now and what, what you expect uh, them to do in the future, specifically in terms of what you have control over? Sure, um, so my role in TTSA, well, it's supposed to be the security guy, because uh, that's kind of my background. Um, for those of you who don't know, I spent a little bit of time, uh, a lot of time, and counterintelligence security. I was a special agent in charge at one point uh, in my career, focused primarily on, on, on counterterrorism and, and, and espionage type stuff. Um, as far as my role in, in TTSA, it's supposed to be that. Unfortunately, I find myself spending a lot of my time actually, um, well, uh, doing a lot of kind of the same stuff I was doing in ATIP. Um, that is collecting data. Um, wherever that is, whatever whatever that may look like, and being able to analyze that and then deliver that information to other members of our team, people like Hal Pudoff, Steve Justice from, from Lockheed Skunk Works, who have the scientific expertise necessary to, to look at this stuff and, and make a determination, is it from here, is it man-made, or is it something else? Um, as far as the overall role of TTSA, I, I think I briefly covered that, but probably not good enough. Um, think of TTSA right now as a, um, as a startup, I'd love to say aerospace company, but I'm not quite sure we're actually aerospace yet, but we're getting close. Uh, a small startup company that wants to collect the truth, speak the truth and maybe uh, an enabling capability, a bridging capability between the government and the private sector and academia. Um, we have several portfolios. We have a scientific portfolio. We have a field operations portfolio. We have an entertainment portfolio. People say, an entertainment portfolio? Why do you have an entertainment portfolio? Because storytelling is as natural as mankind itself. Ever since man was living in caves, we have been telling our story on the walls whether it is biblical stories or stories of mankind sailing the ocean blue, we've always told stories. Can you imagine for just a moment being a reporter on the deck of one of those ships for the very first time that was gonna sail over the horizon to somewhere new? Were you gonna fall off the edge of the earth? 
Are there sea monsters, right? All these things that are going, wouldn't you love to capture that first voyage? Well, in entertainment, that's kind of what we want to do. There's a little bit of storytelling there. And we want to try to record this and, and uh, you know, because in the end, this is a story about all of us. So um, that's what the entertainment division is doing. much for your presentation. Yes, sir. Um, as, a, as a professional physicist interested in interstellar travel, I'm wondering if you could tell us anything about the physics of these objects or the hypotheses that sure. are on the table. Yeah, uh, there's a lot. Um, first and foremost, uh, I think there's a misnomer. People think you have to break the laws of physics. Uh, oh, that something's going faster than light. Nobody said that. Nobody's saying something's going faster than light. What we're talking about is warping space-time. Now people say, well, that's, you know, voodoo science. Look, it, it is a fact, folks. I, I don't know what to tell you. The fact that we're on this planet, space-time is being warped because you have a massive object floating in space. And the, 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 the nearer or closer you are to a massive object in space, the greater space-time is warped. That is the reason why the GPS satellites that we use, I'm sure you know this, sir, that are up above us, with the exact same cesium atomic clock as we have here on the ground station, operate, and those you have a, something called atomic clock drift. That is because the space-time being experienced further away from the Earth is fundamentally different. Einstein proved it. Einstein theorized it, and then, of course, Hawkins further expounded upon it. But that's a scientific fact. We see it every day. You see it with gravitational lensing when we're talking about, about large, large clusters of galaxies. If you were standing on the surface of the sun, if you could withstand it, time would go by fundamentally different than they do here on Earth. If you go by a black hole, time goes even, it goes even crazier. So we know Mother Nature already warps space-time. It's not a question of if, it's a fact. So the question is, is it theoretically possible to warp space-time in which space-time can be compressed? There's a shortcut. Is there a way to, in essence, ride the wave tops of that space-time? So what appears to me as this crazy sudden acceleration, hypersonic velocities, and low observability, and anti-gravity is really a function of you being able to insulate yourself, in theory, from the natural effects of Earth's gravitational force. And by the way, to resist gravitational force, the net effect would be not only you just floating, not having to have wings or thrust or rockets or an engine, or even wings, but time itself would be fundamentally experienced differently for you inside that bubble than the rest of us outside that bubble, even though we're all living in the same three-dimensional space. So in a nutshell, without going into a whole lot of physics here, that's probably well above me. Um, we, have, we have now some, some mathematical models and, and, and the scientific modeling from some really good physicists. We've actually now been able to replicate at the micro level the warping of space-time at the Large Hadron Collider in the CERN. Don't look now, but do you remember when three years ago scientists were saying, we are now creating micro black holes, and people said, oh my gosh, you're going to suck the world inside, and it's going to get sucked. That's not what they were saying. What they were saying is we have now created energy levels high enough where we are beginning to warp space-time in a laboratory. And that's what that means. And so the question is, if we can do it, that's not a question. Well, we've done it already. We've been doing it for three years. The real question is a technological question. It's a scalability question. That's the question. So whether it is or isn't, that's not up for argument anymore. It is. The question is, how? Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. It was great meeting you earlier today. Oh, sure, sure. And thank you Pleasure again. Uh, thank you again for your service, your continued service. Um, sir, a, um, a mid-sized uh, corporation anywhere in America with an enterprise-level IT infrastructure and a campus-wide desktop support um, would have a budget well in excess of $22 million just for that aspect of their operation. Uh, if you were able to do what uh, the slides say, for $22 million, it's the gold standard in spending tax dollars uh, in the US. And I, I, I'd like to understand uh, or have you explain, how did you make that money, $22 million stretch? What was it really spent on? Is there sure. money in the missing Pentagon trillions of dollars that were funneled into this 
operation. Sure. And uh, how how can we get the rest of the government to operate as efficiently as yours did? Well, well, thank you for that 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 compliment. I think. Um, so there's an old saying we have in the Department of Defense. What do you call a vision, a company vision, or a, or, or a organizational vision without a budget? It's a hallucination. Right? So uh, in this particular case, um, you're right. Twenty-two million dollars by some is considered budget dust, um, but by others it's considered um, a healthy start, and it's a proof of concept. It's a prototype. And so you do what you can, and you dual use the hell out of everything you can. What do I mean by that? That means you get as many friends as you possibly can that are, ally that are, are that have an allegiance to, to your mission, and use them to the greatest extent possible. It also means leveraging academia in areas that you can, for free if you can, because students are always looking for some sort of graduate level program to work on, project, thesis. Um, it also means um, managing your money really, really carefully. Um, I, I grew up a blue collar guy. Um, you know, I'll tell you, I did construction, I was a mechanic, I had anything I could to get by and pay my way through college, join the army. Um, I know what it's like to, to, to live um, thrifty. Uh, I applied that same philosophy at work. I didn't consider anything budget dust even though a lot of my folks had much bigger budgets than me. Uh, I looked at it as an honor and a privilege by the American people, your hard tax. I would submit to you that if you had that $22 million in your pocket right now, as an individual, you'd probably be pretty happy. Uh, you could do a lot of things with it. So it was incumbent upon the organization I was with, the staff I was working with, and myself, that we spent every single penny in a way that gave us the most bang for our buck. We didn't just go out and say, mm, yeah, that seems like a good idea. We would sit there and round table the hell out of things and try to figure out, is this the best way to spend our resources? Look, look at MUFON right now. You've got a lot of people sitting in this room right now. And you're surviving off things like memberships and getting people interested and I've had t-shirts and hats as a form of survival. Well, to some degree, we were kind of the same way. Uh, we had to make sure every dollar was stretched as far as we possibly could stretch it. And $22 million may not seem like a lot to some organizations, but it was for us. And keep in mind, DOD is an organization that's omnipresent. We are global. So it's easy to be in the world's largest company and send down a lightning bolt and say, I want that person to be at that place at that time, use that airplane, which I don't have to pay for, and I want you to collect that information and report it back to me. That doesn't cost me anything. That cost jet fuel, but it didn't cost me anything. So um, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, I think, you know, Lean Six Sigma, I mean, I don't, don't want to go into corporate strategic, you know, uh, way of doing business, but we did adopt a lot of that. You know, we obviously, you have milestones and benchmarks, you have uh, mission objectives, enterprise objectives, and you try to stick to those as much as possible and make sure all that aligns. You don't do anything in an organization that's not aligned to your ultimate mission and your vision. If it's not helping the mission, not wasting my time or money on it. So, next question. Sir. Uh, I, don't, I don't really have a question, but I just want to say, if you, Huge thank you on behalf of probably, I, I don't know the number, but, but every day on the internet, two. more and more young people, people that, more and uh, more young people on, <laughs> on Twitter, on Reddit, on YouTube, on Twitch, that they're flocking to you and they're flocking to, to the stars. And so for as much flack as you take, I just want you to know there's a huge population of, of, of people internationally. I, I talked to friends in Russia and Spain everywhere else that are not just behind you but they're like, like people were behind John Connor <laughs> gosh well I, I appreciate that but I, I you know I, I, there's gonna be times I'm gonna say stupid things I say them all the time just ask my girls I mean I, and um, but my commitment to you is I, I'll always speak the truth um, you may not like it and uh, I may not have all the answers I certainly don't in fact like I said before I have a lot more questions than I have answers but I'll always tell you the truth 
Um, I don't have an agenda. I don't have a cottage industry. I'm not being paid to be here. Um, I'm not here trying to push my belief system on anybody. I'm not creating a dollar by YouTube views. Um, I am um, I'm simply here because you asked me to be. So I'm here. Um, and all you have to tell me is you don't want me to be here and I won't be here. But thank you very much for the compliment. So I have two questions. My first question is, why 2007? What happened in 2007 to make the, uh, that led to the senators to decide to create this program? My second question is, what's your personal view on Roswell? Do you think it was Project Mogul, or, or was it really an alien space crash? If so, where are the bodies? Um, let's start with the 2007. Um, I can't speculate, because that's a question I think would be a great question to ask Senator Reid. Um, unfortunately, Senator Reid right now has got some health issues. Um, uh, you know, obviously pray for a, a quick recovery for him. Um, but I would talk to him because I could speculate here all night of what I think he might be thinking. But uh, he could probably tell you a whole lot better than I can what he was actually thinking. I suspect that uh, they had enough information, critical mass, if you will, to come to the determination that this was worth looking into. Um, I suspect it may have been even from information that MUFON developed. Wouldn't that be something? Um, okay, now as far as um, the next question you had, I, I don't want to forget that. Um, Roswell. Uh, I wasn't around for Roswell. Um, but I might look, I know this is, looks, this is blonde, not gray, so I'm not that old. Um, but obviously, um, to every rumor, there's a grain of truth. Obviously, something happened. Obviously, the military was engaged. They admitted they were. Uh, obviously, there were civilians engaged because they acknowledged it. So something happened. Something happened. Um, given what the report says, there was a crash. Something crashed in the desert in Roswell, and the military was involved. That's correct. True, 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 true. Um, the real question is, what was it? And in order to answer that question, if absent of the information, we'd have to build the case. We would have to go through all the data and figure out what was the response by the military? Was that response typical for a crash like that? If it was a balloon, indeed a balloon, would you have a response like that? Would they have surrounded the area, kept it quiet, trucked everything away, where did they truck it to, who was in charge, who was a commanding officer, who was executive officer, all those type of things you want to ask. What type of vehicles did you use? Believe it or not, in intelligence, you can, you can, make, you can determine a lot of things by looking at signatures. So did they bring in army jeeps or did they bring in flatbeds? Because I'll tell you, a Mylar balloon doesn't need a flatbed. So these are the questions that one would want to ask, right? What was the senior ranking officer on site? Was it a staff sergeant? Was it a major? Was it a colonel? Right? Um, so those are all the questions as an investigator I'm certainly going to want to ask. Uh, and that will help me in absence of the actual physical evidence to begin to put pieces of the puzzle together. So I know I'm not answering your question to be truly honest with you. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Hi, um, can you talk about what you dropped off with Hal Pudoff? Do you have biological material? Do you have metal material? Whew. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, my mic working? <laughs> kind of hot in here. Um, <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, we are, uh, we are involved um, in a whole swath of things. Cast a wide net, catch as many fish as you can. Um, so if, um, as an organization, if there was material that was being offered to us, yeah, we're going to collect it. Yeah, we're going to analyze it. And in fact, when you analyze something, people say, I'm going to hand you this, analyze it. Well, it's not that easy. Okay? First thing you do is you document it, you photograph it, you isolate it, you protect it, and then you ship it off. 
And when it goes for analysis, you're going to look at, you're going to start big and work your way small. The first thing you're going to do is look at this object. And you're going to say, what color is it? What shape is it? How much does it weigh? Is it shiny? Is it opaque? Is it metallic? Is it plastic? Is it organic, right? All these things you can look at as physical properties. Then you're going to look at it outside and say, is there heat ablation? Is there material vitrification as a result of overheating? To what temperatures would cause that? Then you're going to look at you're going to say, hmm, how about electroconductivity? Does it conduct electricity? Is there electromagnetic frequencies involved with this? Is it EMF? Is it potentially radioactive? All these things you would look at in a physical sense. Then, once you begin to look at this thing and say, yes, this, this, is, this is unique, then you're going to go into more detailed analysis. Now we're going to go from a physical analysis to a chemical and molecular level analysis. We're going to look at the chemical compositions, the relationships one molecule has with another, are there any nuances associated with that relationship? For example, anything unique that these two materials, why would you put these two materials together? Um, you can look at the, at the actual molecular matrices involved, uh, the, the construct, the, the way they are bonded together, right? For those physical properties. Then, depending on that, if you find some unique stuff, like let's say iridium, by the way, pretty important, because that's not really here in large quantities naturally. So if you have a, a sample that's got a lot of iridium, chances are it's not from here. Um, you're going to look at uh, maybe there's strontium involved, uranium, and maybe a unique type of uranium involved. If you find some anomalies there, then you're going to go one step deeper, and you're going to look at the atomic analysis. This is where you're looking at isotopic ratios, individual atoms themselves. And you're going to look, is there anything unique about that, that ion, that isotope, meaning when you have an electron fall into the nucleus of an atom and, it's, and it, it, it becomes one with a proton, it becomes a neutron. And that occurs naturally. Percentages of, of ions occur naturally in Mother Nature. We see it all the time. And we actually engineer ourselves isotopes for very specific purposes. But there are some isotopic structures that are so unique that they would be almost impossible to engineer. And if you did, it would cost you billions of dollars. So what do I mean by that? Let's, let me give you a very quick analogy because I think it's a very important question you ask. If I want to make a ball of uranium-238, okay? I can't go into specifics, but just let's say a little baseball worth of uranium-238. It's going to cost me billions and billions of dollars to do that. You say, well, why is that blue? I mean, it's not that much material because First of all, it takes tremendous centrifuges and technology to enrich uranium. It's going to take a train load with infrastructure of uranium-235 to be able for me to get to the amount of uranium that I'm looking for. It's going to take a small city worth of infrastructure in order to generate the power requirements just to feed the electronic equipment and the centrifuges to create that material. So my point is to create a little piece this much we know it will cost country X, X amount of billions of dollars. So you can look at that as a calculus when you see something truly exotic and you say to yourself, what would it cost us in terms of today's money to create just that small sample? And that's gonna then allow you to know what countries out there have that capability. There's only certain countries that can afford it and even have the technological expertise and the infrastructure and the wherewithal to even create that relationship. So. Material can tell you a lot. Again, the truth she likes to whisper, so you really have to listen sometimes. And that's what we try to do within TTSA. Look at it in a way where, where, where we can start to figure things out, applying some of the techniques we have in intelligence and military and law enforcement investigative type techniques that allow us to, to, to look at this piece of material logically. Because in the end, supposition doesn't really help any of us. You know what assuming does, right? There's an old saying about what, what happens when you assume, right? So we try not to assume. So. Lewis, thank you very much for being here and speaking to us and yes, presenting, presenting your information. My question is this. You mentioned earlier that uh, in the short, uh, short term, about a year from now perhaps, we'll be having a fundamentally different conversation based on data, models, et cetera, that, uh, that, that, has been, that have been developed. 
collected and developed. Okay. Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned, you had up on the, up on the slide, you mentioned um, national, national security and, and humanity in, in, the, in the same sentence. I know. Okay. So can you speak a bit about, okay, let me ask, let me, let me digress. So the, the data you've collected, that has been collected, and the models developed, which is, which is incredible, um, very promising. How does that, will, will those things be applied for national security and or for the good of humanity or, or it's at some point? I understand national security is paramount. I can appreciate that. Thank you for your service. Um, how, wh where, where do you see that, that, that information going mm -hmm. in the future? Well, I, I, I think you. fundamentally national security can be symbiotic with humanity. I think if national security done correctly, and oftentimes it is, most of the time it is, um, it is for humanity. If it's good for us and we do it in a responsible manner, hopefully it's good for, what's good for the geese is good for the flock, hopefully. Um, where's it gonna go in the future? Boy, that's a tough question. You know, there's always, there's always this duality thing we deal with, right? So with every good thing we invent, you invent nuclear power, I invent the nuclear bomb. You invent the airplane, I invent the bomber, right? So um, that is just the way we are. And we do it because unfortunately we're human beings and we like to fight each other and we like to go to war. Um, will this be a paradigm shift for the sake of humanity and maybe allow us to maybe get our heads out of the sand a little bit and start focusing somewhere else instead of at each other? Boy, that'd be great. That'd be great. But frankly, that, that's not up to me. It's frankly up to a lot of folks down here. It's, it's up to the next generation. I saw a lot of young folks in this audience earlier, and I will tell you, you're the ones who are going to make that decision how this applies to humanity. You're the ones that got to carry the torch that we failed to bring to the finish line. So really that question you have, that's really a question for the next generation. How is this going to apply? And this is why I'm always encouraged to see the next generation. You know, in our generation, we had this conversation. People would think you're certifiably insane. You had this conversation with my daughters, friends and their generation. They, they look at you and they literally say, duh, we already know. What do you mean you already know? Yeah, dad, you know, it's common knowledge with my generation. So I think there's, 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 a, a, I think there's a generation gap. And I think and to some degree they have a much better appreciation, understanding, and acceptance of what we have all been working so hard for so long. Thank you for your work. Fascinating information you're getting here. Yes, um, I'm hearing a lot of good things that could possibly come out of this on the findings. I hate to be the doom and gloom guy, but I gotta ask the question. Sure. What if this is something that can go wrong? These abilities that you seem to be capturing here, the potential for these abilities that seem to be outside our normal physics. Mm -hmm. If this is something that we would have to defend ourselves against, what's worst case scenario? Have well, you I thought about you, it? I, I, follow you. I would tell you already, it's too late because it's here. So we have a choice. We can live with our heads buried in the sand and hope it goes away, or we can take our head out of the sand and try to figure out how it works. But whether we choose to accept it or not, it doesn't care. It doesn't really care what we think in this room because it's here. So whether or not we choose to accept it, well, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, if you, I mean, no offense to anybody, but if you really think the earth is flat, I, I don't know what to tell you. You know, uh, in this particular case, it's here. So I think this is not like a discussion of fine wine. This conversation doesn't get better the longer we don't talk about it, right? The longer it ages, not a good idea. In fact, we should have had this conversation 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and we should have been a little bit more open about it. So we wouldn't be where we are here today. Um, that's just my perspective. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I appreciate your describing how you uh, go about analyzing f uh, physical evidence. Uh, on a more personal basis, can you tell us about materials that you saw, that you handled, touched, smelled, whatever? Uh, I don't think this is working, is it? <laughs> um, I, I, unfortunately, I cannot talk about specifically what I, I may have had access to while working in the government. Uh, I am no longer employed with the United States government, and therefore I am not at liberty to discuss inherently government business that could potentially involve classified information. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to even presume that, to, to, that I can have that conversation. Um, so uh, I will politely deflect that um, because I, I can't tell you what I may have physically seen or touched or did. But what I can tell you is I would not be wasting my time now putting so much effort into this if I didn't feel there was a compelling reason um, that we shouldn't be looking into it. Um, and unfortunately, that's about as far as I, I'm prepared to go on that right now. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, a little bit of a long setup on this question. Okay. But a friend of mine who I trust very much that I've known for maybe 25 years mm -hmm. who has been involved in a lot of technical areas and is really a genius, he turned me on to this book and he said, I can verify some of what this book covers. And I'm very impressed by this bizarre reality. The book was by Dan Sherman called Above Black. It talks about Project Preserved Destiny. And the premise of the book is a guy in the Army, ordinary guy, goes to another base for training during the day, and then he's told he's going to have special training in the evening. Long story short, he's told, I can only tell you a couple sentences. The next per contact you have will tell you more, but your mother was an abductee. You have been given special uh, abilities. The government wants to exploit those abilities. You will be trained. And basically, you will have to be able to receive messages from aliens telepathically. You will be trained for this possibility because there will come a time where we will have no ordinary communication. There will be a, a, a catastrophe. I'm really summarizing the book because this is, uh, you know, need to know. Everybody just tells him one paragraph and he's like, what the hell? Eventually he gets out of it because he's, he's too weirded out by it, but he does receive messages and he does participate in the program for some time. And it's very hard for him to get out of the program, but he's able to do so. Do, are you familiar with the book? Are you familiar with that premise? Can you speak to that at all, that it's a possibility? What can you say? Uh, Ma'am, I am not familiar with the book, nor am I familiar with, with that activity. Um, you know, again, I, I, I'm not up here to disagree with anybody's feelings, experiences, beliefs. I think those things are sacred to each and, and, and every individual. But if you ask me my experience, which I believe is what you're asking me, I can tell you that I am unaware of that effort. How you doing, sir? Good, sir. How are you? Uh, I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. I served on the U.S.S. Iowa in 1985. Thank you for your service, nine. by the way, profound. Uh, Thank you. I just really have the most simplest question to ask you. It's usually a, just a yes or no. From where you're at, where you are at in the government position, is there extraterrestrials here on Earth right now? It's a yes or no question. It's not a yes or no question, unfortunately. It'd be disingenuous for me to answer it that way. Um, you know, if, if you talk to some medical doctors right now, they will tell you there's conclusive evidence that viruses are not from this planet. They came from somewhere else. And if you look at it from a microbiology perspective, one can make the argument because it doesn't have DNA, it only has RNA, that it's very possible that these things, I mean, they might not be from here. I don't know. I heard. Uh, yeah, I know that. But sure. Extraterrestrials. No, well, extraterrestrial I understand where you're going, but what my, speak, right? my point being is that that's a question that that the answer to that is very subjective because the bottom line is it doesn't matter what I think I've told the folks before 
there's there's kind of a little 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 rule we have in intelligence. Don't tell people what you believe because time and time again, we're human beings. And I can be absolutely certain of something, and I can also be absolutely wrong. And we have seen that over and over again. And so for me to tell you my personal feeling in just a simple yes or no would be disingenuous because in the end, it's not a yes or no answer. It's really not. I know people wanted to think it that way, but it's not. You know, we could argue till the cows come home about the possibility of alien life and whether it's here, whether it's been here, whether it's going to be here. Um, in the end, we have, to, we have to let the data speak for itself. And until I have data that I can present to you to say, here you go, which by the way, I'm not saying we don't. I'm just saying these things take time. These things take time. And I'm not going to formulate my opinion prematurely. Have I seen weird things? Damn right I have. Have I seen very compelling we, things? We've all seen weird things. Right. And so, so you know, I, I'd love to tell you one way or the other, but, but I'm not prepared to do it until I have all the facts. Believe me, you don't want me to do it. I, 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 it's... it's I, That's I really a temptation. Like I, I know it seems like a great... It, believe I me, mean, it's not. Whether or not you're true or not, I'm just saying, in your position in the government... Uh, I, it's, I, I it's understand just, what you're saying. You know, I really do, and I can appreciate it. But it, it, would be, it would be irresponsible for me to tell you what I think during my position, um, because we need more facts. And once we have those facts, I'll be the first one to tell you what I think. But, I would, but I we're would not there yet. You. So, thank you. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Lou. I have one more question. <laughs> I'm going to come back down to earth. You know, I'm a Gemini. I like long walks on the beach. And... <laughs> so, uh, let's let's leave your your military stuff and let's talk about T TTSN. Okay. Okay. So uh, I love these little breadcrumbs that you leave because I, they, they, you drop them on the ground and I eat them up like a sandwich. And so uh, what I'm going to ask you is about your current work. You're working with Eric Davis or have worked with Eric Davis. Yep. Uh, and you are working with Hal Putoff. Yep. Uh, and these are the preeminent, some of the preeminent physicists on our planet dealing with the notion of, of uh, faster than light or Mm -hmm. you know, uh, interstellar travel. I agree. And so my question to you is, regarding TTSA, is part of that program that you're working on right now with TTSA, does that involve research and development of a current possibly working model that might duplicate or approximate the ability to cancel out gravity? Are you guys working on an anti-gravity spacecraft at this time right now? Wow. Um, damn. Um, we're, we, are, we are really um, working hard. To, yeah, you're pushing me. <laughs> Almost off the stage. Um, we are working really hard to understand what it takes in order to, to develop um, anti-gravity and what that means uh, because we realize now that 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 gravity this everybody associates as being gravity it's not that's an effect of gravity this is an effect of the warping of space-time which is all around us and the if and, and the speed in which you see this varies all around the universe which means space-time varies all around the universe that's, that's fact. I'm just showing it to you. So, um, yeah, we are working, trying to figure that out. Uh, and whether it be through um, mathematics and scientific modeling or looking at exotic uh, combinations of materials, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Can I go to the bathroom? <laughs> yeah.
you know, I, I, I sat in on some of the uh, uh, investigator, field investigator training, and yes, uh, I was very impressed with the level of uh, technical um, uh, specificity, the accuracy, the um, scrupulousness about She's facts. amazing. She's facts versus, fantastic. Uh, and so, I'm sorry folks, but I got to express a little disappointment about the caliber of questions that came to you tonight. Uh, uh, some of them. Uh, uh, I've waited 43 years for this kind of revelation, and I would think that of all the venues in which you could deliver this kind of information, that uh, the questions would have been a little bit more directed towards things that you can answer. Um, rather than constantly pressing for things that obviously you can't or shouldn't. Um, what you said earlier about um, the conversation taking on a different tone a year from now, mm -hmm. uh, it also relates to what you were saying about words mean something very specific. You know, the phrase you use there, I've heard a number of times, wake up people, it means something, okay, hint, hint. Uh, I, I've been annoyed by this in my own uh, life where you're, you start to say something, it's, it's, there's a thing called a syllogism, A, B, therefore C. He's given us A, he's telling us a year from now there'll be B, would you let him get there, you know? <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, I just want to say thank you for sure. what you're, you've done so far, and, and it's of inestimable, uh, inestimable value uh, to the, you know, the, the, the goals that we are uh, pursuing here. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, sir. It's been my honor and pleasure. <laughs> Folks, thank you sincerely. I really appreciate your, your hospitality and your patience. I know I tend to yammer quite a bit, but... Thank you very much. It's, it's, okay. Lou, I'd like to thank you for being here and, and being with us. We really enjoyed it. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.